Welcome to the Change of a Podcast. On today's episode, we have world number 233, Clement Chedek from France. He lets us know his opinions on who is the next big thing in professional tennis, if the professional tennis calendar is too long, and does having a lot of professional events translate to having the next Grand Slam champion. Enjoy the episode. Who do you think is going to be like the next like big top three? I'm thinking sometimes looking at Fonseca, like watching playing challengers, bro. And oh like, my this god, guy this can man be is like a joke. He's a joke. One of those guys, like in I don't know, maybe one year. I don't know how fast he's gonna be. Yeah, but he can be like one of the guys that are like winning slam in a year now. Yo, from now, Justin, today today we're discussing this. Tell, tell me what you think. You go home there. Okay. What what should his ranking be? Like, if you think he's healthy and playing well, and like, where do you think he settles? Like his ranking, you know? We'll go over uh, top thirty. Top thirty? He's already yeah. there. Yeah, he's top thirty. You think yeah. that's it? You think he stays around top thirty? You you don't think he can go higher than that? He's he's eighteen right now. He's eighteen. Yeah, I think. I mean, he can go higher, but like. When you say where he should be, you mean like where he's going to end okay. year after okay. year? Yeah, where yeah. is so, his limit? So what happened, today, what happened today was like we were walking, and for those of you who don't know, we're in, uh, we're in France at the 25. Um, Clem's actually in the final tomorrow, by the way. But um, we, there's a picture of all the past players, and he's one of the players. So I looked at the picture, I go, ah, oh, decent player, huh? And Clem goes, yeah, like I think he's going to be top 10. And I said, oh, that's... Okay, if he's going to be top 10, who comes out of the top 10? And then all of a sudden, it's a tough discussion. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, with like, I don't know if I see him as like a guy who's going to be in a top 10 year after year after year after year, but I could see him having a season where he's he's in there. I, I could see yeah. it. Like, yeah, I don't I, disagree fully with Francis's take. Like, I feel like the top 10 is not like a steadfast these 10 guys. I feel like maybe the top three, four, five is like, pretty consistent but i think after that you're gonna have some some movement i feel like yeah i i i do think the same thing like the top five is really tough to yeah to go like i don't think joker alcaraz senior uh what is uh zverev and medvedev this this is so consistent casper uh, yeah. Yeah. is eight i think is not uh is not top five but like i think those five guys just and Rublev can play really well, but he's also on and off. He's so struggling far. on and so, off, yeah. Just the top five right now, for me, is like has been really consistent. Like they prove like for quite a bit now already. So yeah. I don't think it's that wide open the quarterfinal of a slam because you most likely gonna play one of those guys. For sure. Yeah. And what is your view on let's say the game in general? Like down to challenges, down to futures? Because right now I'm in Serbia at a 15k and i'm here with my friend uh, roberto said he's in the final tomorrow nice. but i think second round he so he used to be like around 210 in the world 215 something like okay. that and second round he played a guy a thousand i think yesterday he played a guy also around that ranking and today someone like 500 but the level of all matches have been actually very high matches are super physical he has to kind of play his best to win or to get through I feel like maybe in some moments it's like maybe the guy breaks a little bit, but it's not like he said, not like before. He said two weeks ago he played in Santo Domingo in the 125. He played Hugo Carabelli, who's like 90. Yeah. And he lost, I think, six and four, something like this. And he said he couldn't sense a difference in the tennis level between, let's say, Carabelli and the guy he played in the second round. He said maybe Carabelli might have been a little bit better physically, like he didn't drop intensity at any moment. And then maybe like, Mentally, he didn't crack as much, but he felt like serve, forehand, backhand, whatever. It's like the level is high, even deep into the into the rankings. You feel the same? Yeah, and I I said like the good example for me is like the example where I play well and I can go through a lot of running challengers and the moment where I can lose early in futures, and I don't think my forehand, my backhand, on, or like. Any of my shots are really different, but yeah, yeah, the one thing is like just from those level, I think the margin is thin, and most of the time it's just like 
there is some game where I would like give away one game a set or two game a set or like a bad service game every set. And that like, I, when those things happen, I think my level drops like to like early futures level. And when I'm not, when my focus is really good and I'm not giving away those games, like as you friends say about Carabelli, probably reconsistent all over the match, even though the shot didn't feel that different. Like uh, the guy is just not going to give away anything and maybe lock in the important points a little more. And when yeah. I'm able to do that, that's when I'm, I can, I don't know, like get in the last stage of challenger. So I would say, yeah, the tennis, like sometimes you got to be so ready for everyone. Like yeah. the, uh, the, walk, the local wall card, you play first round. Like I had some tricky match. I mean, I, it's just everybody plays well and i think it's just gonna be more and more like that since you know there is now i say there is more player that can live off tennis and that just like gonna attract more player and also like the college tennis condition like attracting even more now it's just i think it's giving more opportunities for like more player can access to good condition to practice and get better yeah. and i think you can feel that on the throw and i i just think it's gonna be just more and more player just playing well and it's uh i my coach said like i this time so my coach was mad anger um he was uh 23 in the wall and he said i don't think the level of the top 100 changed that much but definitely being 300s before and 300s now is huge difference like mm -hmm. the guys before like no shot of winning like even playing a close match to a top hundred guys, and now, yeah. What I notice now is like fifty definitely can beat someone who's ninety. Yeah, you see that from time to time, for sure. I feel like a couple of years ago at fifteen k's, you would see like guys, some guy with like a really bad forehand or a really bad backhand. I don't really see bad shots anymore. Maybe some guys make bad decisions or something, but it's like you don't really see as many like weak sides or like simple paths to victory. It looks more like. The guy who is able to, let's say, maybe impose himself more on the match more consistently is, is going to win. But it doesn't look like one guy is just bad or doesn't deserve to be there. I feel like I feel like the level is the level seems pretty high at least in this this I week think, where I'm at. I think also you can see that statistically because I remember like when I was playing singles before COVID, I remember you needed like eight, nine, maybe ten points to be top thousand. I don't know, like that was like one of the little mini goals that I had, like. Like yeah. stepping stones for me. I think it's like 14 or something. Yeah, exactly. It's more, yeah. So it's like, so you just, you can see just to get to a base ranking, the points are way more, you know, and I'm sure mm -hmm. that's the same going up, up the rankings. So yeah, like, yeah, exactly. And also like that also due to the fact that it's maybe more tournaments that's and true. just like, so more people playing pro tournaments every week. Yeah. And I think there is no thing that gets you better than just playing those matches yeah. at higher level. And it's just like, just small player get good practice condition and pro level matches, and then they just like just get tennis more and more consistent. I think it's the same thing in doubles too. Like, I think it was maybe early last year I was looking at points, and I think I needed two hundred points to get to three hundred. And right now to get to three hundred, it's like maybe two fifteen, two twenty. Like it's going up. So I think overall tennis is just getting deeper. More people are playing tournaments and. You have to earn it even more yeah. to get to the same like number as the yeah. pass. And the, the points, is... the points change too. Sorry, like That's the true. so the futures points went down, and then the challenger points went down, and the ATP points went up. So like to get through now is even like you have to play more weeks and you have to do better results. So or you need some wild cards into big events and you need to do well. I feel like yeah, which is uh. Which is an interesting topic. I had that debate with Calvin Emery once, like with uh, like should we have a limited amount of wild card? Just because when you come from some country that don't have as much tournaments, like you are just starting with big disadvantage compared to bro, like, like French people. France yeah. has a million thousand yeah. tournaments. Yeah. Oh my god! This is what I wanted to talk about. Like, I guess we can go there now. It was supposed to come up later in the podcast, but uh, there's this tweet from US Open. And it says. Your Friday night just got a whole lot better. And it's the it's the picture of Fritz and Francis in the semis. Um, basically saying that, you know, obviously a winner, the, the, there's going to be an American in the finals of the U.S. Open. 
And then John Wertheim tweeted and said, seriously, USDA needs to pick a consistent position here. If you want to take a victory lap for American success, great. But then don't say we are cutting the player development budget. We are not responsible for building champions. So what he is talking about here is that, I don't know if you're aware of this, but 2024, there were less pro tournaments than 2023 in the USA. And that mm -hmm. was on purpose because they cut the professional budget for tournaments. And I think the reasoning for that was that the USTA believed that um, it wasn't working. Like having all these tournaments wasn't aiding in creating, I don't even know what their main goal was. I don't know if it was having a certain amount of players break through, or I don't mm. know if it was to get a Grand Slam champion. I don't know what their end goal was, but basically they believed that it wasn't working. And then the discussion that we had today was that last the, la, this week in France, there's Cassie Challenger and there's a 25 plus age. Next week is Ren Challenger. There's a 25 plus age. Then the week after is Saint Tropez, and then it just goes like Challenger, 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 Challenger. I think it's like what do you say, like 15 in a row uh, or something? Is, yeah, like, there is maybe like maybe eight, but total in the year there is probably close to 20. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then there's also futures in France these same weeks too, in some yeah. of the weeks. So like this, and and I know that happens a little bit in the US too, but I've never seen this many challenges back to back to back in the US. So why? Why would the U.S. decide to take away playing opportunities and France, obviously, is just giving so many opportunities to their players, you know? Yeah. Like, no, so. It's, that's it's why the same in other countries, too. Like, you have it in, in Italy. You have a yeah, lot of guys coming through now I because mean, they have job, challenges yeah. all the time and features all the time. I know that Portugal has a lot of tournaments as well. A lot of 25s, 15s yes. and challenges. So, I feel like... I mean, it's the best way to get your players better. They get... From a young age, they see a high level of tennis, and then they get to, as they go through the rankings, they get to play these events and feel the level, and they get to play week in, week out. They get to save money, so they can play within their home country. And some of these countries are smaller than the U.S., so like you can take a train or you can drive two, three hours exactly, to different yeah. tournaments. You get to stay at home with your family. I think, I think it's yeah. it's one of the things in the U.S. Like sometimes they're not building things that swing. Like yeah. you got to travel so far, so like you say, okay, like. I'm going for the US swing and my friends like that plays double Lucas Sanchez is like uh you know like as doubles player you try to save money sometimes and it's like playing in the US is like it's not a US swing it's like playing in Europe like it's just one here one here one here it's so costly mm -hmm. and it doesn't help so yeah when you see I think the perfect example in the recent year in Italy how many young Italian guys in the top 200 it's amazing like yeah. 20 under like 24 I mean, years old you would think they just, just have so many challenges yeah, they, and they get opportunities every yeah, day yeah they just give themselves the best chance by giving exactly. their players the most yeah. opportunities to play you and know? you play as you said you play at the higher level and you just you've you've got to adapt to that level so you naturally improve just because that's that's your daily life like the next week you're gonna play a guy that is 150 you gotta be as consistent as the guy it's pretty interesting that you say about you know, like if they impose some sort of wild card limit, mm. but you're sitting in a position where you're, you came out of college as one of the best in college tennis. You played futures, you've won futures, you've done well in challenges, you've been successful in every level of uh, of tennis so far, but you're still sitting there from a position. And I'm sure you've had help with mm. wild cards and stuff, but you're still sitting there from a position of maybe we shouldn't get too many of these because yeah. we have way more playing opportunities. It's than actually, I didn't take you. I took the position of like limiting. Cal Calvin was really big on that. It was okay. like, that's so unfair. And I was like, I kind of get his point. That's why I, I didn't really have an opinion on that, but I think it would be more fair to like, yeah, do have a limited amount. And Yeah, but I mean... I guess that's just a decision that the national federations make. So, like, why, mm. like, if there's no like rule on it now, then why wouldn't the French Federation, if they want to host a many many tournaments and give many opportunities to their players, why wouldn't they? You know. Yeah, but only... they just if there is a limit like this, they're just gonna have to give opportunities to different players. Yeah. There's so many players too. For you, like being from the Caribbean. How many opportunities are you gonna to get to get World Cup in tournaments? Because <laughs> none, dog. Never. We're talking about exactly. opportunities. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> you better if, go play like, qualies and, and go win matches. <laughs> you better qualify. <laughs> you better grind on the weekend before. Yo, you know what? You know what? Clem told me today. He said his first future he qualified, 
his first challenger he got a wild card, but then the second challenger he qualified, and then he played the friend. Oh, he went to Mars. It was Mars. Oh, Montpellier. First ATP he qualified, and then he went to the French, and he's like, "Well, I've qualified I'm, every time I've leveled up." And then he just got killed by um Zizou by Zizou Bergs. One, like. one fifty. <laughs> but honestly, when I was telling myself that, when I was thinking that, it was just like I was trying to find reason to believe because I wasn't believing much. But <laughs> I'm like, I was to qualify on flat. But uh, yeah, that definitely wasn't enough. That's funny. That's funny. You know, this man is the the king of France. Like the the first day we roll up to this tournament. He's like saying hello to all the people in like the nice suits and the the like fancy dresses and stuff, and everyone's so happy to to see him. Like they take care of him here. Yeah, like this man, the man it's the five time here, which is like four tennis player playing the same futures five times is uh, not a good sign. Okay, you, you haven't stepped up yet. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, you you usually don't want to get to know the people at tournaments too well because <laughs> that means you've been there a little too many times already. Right? <laughs> unless it's the bigger yeah, tournament, unless it's like the slams or anything, yeah. but yeah. That's cool. All right, let's go to the the next topic. So, um, Rusevori had an announcement to make. He said, "Hello, everyone. As you know, the past year has been challenging. I've achieved things I've dreamed of since I was a child, but the balance between work and recovery has not been right due to overloading. I have decided to take a break from tennis and the rest of the year and just focus on physical and mental health." So, do you believe? Do you guys believe that? Um, that the tennis schedule is too hectic and is there any way that they could prevent things like this happening to players because i feel like players in tennis feel that kind of way a lot and not that many people are able to step away like like he is you know because they're afraid yeah. of losing their ranking exactly. and losing their progress and that sort of stuff so how what do you guys think about the amount of weeks that guys have to play in a year i was speaking to uh, ben Locke in peru and then Rob here, and well, Rob has decided he's not gonna play thirty weeks a year or more. Like he said, he's done doing that. But Ben Locke was saying, like when he looks at the guys weekly, like how many weeks they played in a year, it's not. Which guys hard. did he look at? Like the top guys, or just anyone? When guys playing challenges and and challenges. Okay. and like let's say Grand Slam qualities guys, like it's not uncommon to see guys. In the high twenties, low thirties. I've seen the guy as high as uh, as thirty seven weeks, Maxime Janvier, and he's actually out there like breaking rackets every match. Maybe he should take a break. Maybe he's a little yeah, burnt yeah, out. Yeah. No, no, no. He, 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 didn't, he didn't realize yet. But uh, go hug your mom at home. Like go, go, go see your friends, bro. Like yeah, chill out. But not sure his mom was giving him so many hugs. That maybe why it's uh, it's that way. <laughs> maybe there's not that much love uh, waiting for him. <laughs> yeah. So like. There's like, and that, that couples with the points being decreased. So they have these goals of, let's say, making the, the Grand Slams. And those points are getting higher. Like you need to have more points to make the Slams. And then you have all your competitors are playing 25, 30, 35 weeks. So if you don't play as many and you're not winning every week, how are you going to make it to the to that cut? So it's kind of like, it's like a bit of a rat race at this point. It's like you can't yeah. really... You can't really focus on recovery and then also make a living unless you're winning every week. I feel like so part of it yeah. is like you have these weeks on the calendar and it's like, I don't want to be a bitch. You know, yeah. oh, you're tired. You don't want to play because you're tired. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, and especially now that I play doubles, like I was talking to Roy, uh, Roy Stepanov, and he tells me the worst is when he so roy plays like a million weeks like he yeah. plays so much yeah. you know and he'll tell me like come on be a man play 11 in a row yeah. you know <laughs> <He'll say laughs> like 53 weeks in a year probably play 55 or no. 56 right? <laughs> <laughs> there, there is a week where he play two tournaments for sure <laughs> but he will say things to me like the worst is when he takes a week off and he's looking at the results the result, of other people and he's thing. seeing other people pick up points and he's like, for fuck's sake. Like, you know? Yeah, I think when I, I'm not playing, I'm making it a rule to not open sofa score unless it's for Premier League. Bro, yeah, Jody, yeah. Jody opens this app every day. What's it called? Resatina? Resatina or live or this live. It's an addict, bro. It's unbelievable. Every well, day. I just want to see what's going on. I'm just checking it out, you know? And it's a rule for me, especially in the summer with so many tournaments. Yeah. Like, cause like even when you're playing and you do well, there's just so many other guys doing well. So like, you don't even <laughs> feel good. It's true. But I think, yeah, the thing with 
the the calendar is i believe because we have the option to play you don't want to be the person to say oh i'm not going to play this many weeks mm -hmm. because i'm tired but then other people can go and play the weeks and and you know catch yeah. up or pass or whatever so in my opinion like the the off season is too small like they need to make a larger off season for mm. tennis like at a certain point just cut the whole thing like no cut challenges. everything no to no future challenges atp is nothing because it's almost like i don't know if you remember taylor fritz last year was saying something about he believes that they should have like a set amount of tournaments and yeah. players have to play those tournaments and to make it kind of like formula one so you have like a true ranking over the season to yeah. prevent guys from skipping hard courts to play clay courts and skipping you know so it's fair for all surfaces this is how good you are across all surfaces and stuff and i think that's interesting but it needs to be tweaked like i don't think there should just be a I think he made it like 20. They were doing like 20 premium events or some some idea. I don't remember. But I just think that the offseason needs to be smaller and we're forced to take time off. You know, like yeah. it needs to be smaller or, or bigger. Sorry, bigger. The the and off season needs to be bigger. Sorry. I think one thing that can be improved also in the off season is like like a lot of sports too. Like I was at the airports last week. I was playing in Budapest and I was with that guy. I was like Verdasco coach and... I mean, I, I just met him. He just had like that paddle outfit. And I was like, are you a player? And he was the sporting director of the FIP. And they just made... What, what is FIP? What is it? Uh, fe uh, International Federation of Paddle. Okay. So he's the one just like, it would be the one planning the schedule for ATP, like the paddle version of that, that guy. So pretty powerful. And so basically, it's interesting because... He had the tennis experience and the thing he liked and he didn't like, and he's trying to make things better for paddle when he's starting. It's not from scratch because obviously it's it's still a sport that is like uh, I've been professional for some years, but he has more margin to adjust because they are so in control and it's still like getting better. And for his calendar, so same principle with like the ATP, like. It's called differently, but like the 250, the right. uh, the 500, like and the mandatory values. like slams and grand slam. So he kept he kept that, but the off season is full December, and I think it's important to full August too. He kept that summer month, and I think it's a little under. I don't know for you guys in Europe, but that's also where most of the people go on holidays in August. In August, yeah. Okay. So I mean, for people like me. I never get to have holidays with my friends. Yeah. Because my off season is December when I have my time oh. in December. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also because August is a lot of clay tournaments, yeah. which I don't like. But um, I'm the same way. Like it, it, it's like it would be really good for mental health yeah. if people have the opportunity to plan things. To go with a family and of their friends and physical health too. Summer, yeah like yeah, look yeah. how many people get to us open and they're broken exactly and they the go to US open. so many times i just broke down yeah. and if you have like that short period of time where you can rest in the middle of the season like okay you you, you know you gotta go for six months straight and then like four months or whatever that is i've never actually thought of that like i've yeah. never thought of taking like a month in between the season i've thought of like making the off season longer because like for, like what happens to me is like I get to Christmas break and I go home and I take one or two weeks off of no tennis. Yeah. And then I come back and you have to do a few few weeks training block, two yeah. or three weeks training block, and then the season starts again. Yeah. Like you've taken no more than a month and a half away from tennis, you yeah. know? And like I don't know. I, I just think that it's too many matches and too many weeks on the road fighting and they need to regulate that a little bit better. Yeah. But even if it's like just two weeks in August. Just having this yeah, yeah. when also everybody can get back to practice too and not end the year like yeah because then you get you get to the end of the year like the, yeah. like I don't know how it is at the ATPs I'm sure it's this way too but I have a little bit of experience from the indoor challenges in the US and guys are just fucked like yeah. they they get there and they're like you 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 can see it from the doubles the doubles draws because guys are just pulling out left and mm -hmm. right like from from doubles because they they end the year and they don't want to play anymore and they're tired and exhausted and then you're just seeing walkovers and you're seeing like 
interesting results that you don't yeah. normally see. And the know? guy that we injured part of the season or doing well at the end of the season because they're the only one they that had a break. actually fresh. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what's up, guys? Sorry to interrupt the episode. If you're able to, it would mean a lot to us if you could subscribe to the channel. That's the best way to support us, help us to continue to make cool episodes with cool guests, and really gives us the best chance to grow as a business. Thanks so much and enjoy the rest of the episode. When I first talked to Gasquet, that was like, uh, was in Rennes, we had that lunch. And he told me like, to get better in the tennis ranking, you've got to be able to know yourself, to be able to play 35 weeks a year, healthy. That was his advice for me. 35. Yeah, he said it's going to be between 30 and 35. And if you don't play that, then it's you probably that year won't go that much up in the ranking. You've got to play 35 healthy week and how difficult it is to be healthy 35, 35 week weeks. You just bro, don't... this man, how old is guys getting now, bro? I, I don't know, 36? <laughs> I am not. Yeah. Here. He's dropped out of the top 100 and he's right back challenges every week. Like... He's grinding. He's, he just loves the sports. He, he just loves dog. it. Dog. Yeah. I, I love Crazy, him so much patient. He's so much patient for it. Yeah, he, yeah. He loves it. Facts. Yeah. Wow. How many weeks does he play? Still. How many weeks is he trying to play? I mean, Still 35? <laughs> 35. Yeah, I think he play every year as he grows, he just play one more week. Like if he's 37, he play 37 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's unreal, bro. All right, yo, we're gonna get into uh what's it called? The um over and over underrated. Yeah. Before we get to that, one thing. Okay. Long flight right any flight which what's your strategy for the for the armrest battle do you do you, so you're, you're in the plane time. yeah you're on a long flight you're, and you're, you're the in the rest. plane and you got to get to the armrest you're next to a big guy and his Bro, his I what do you in, do i was in budapest so that wasn't a long flight it was like two hours uh, and that guy felt so comfortable having his elbow in <laughs> in my ribs I was like, oh, 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 do you feel that comfortable feeling my ribs? Like, you didn't, you didn't speak it, up. It was yourself? moving a bit, and I felt like the wise was breathing for me. It was just moving my whole body. Just... I was like, I need to. Yeah, it was unbelievable. It was like this. Uh, it wasn't even a big guy. It was just like, maybe he's used to traveling first class or whatever. Yeah. But this time he was in second next to me, and I have his elbow in my rib the whole time, and I'm just too nice. I haven't said anything because I can fight also. So, Jeez, bro. so they went to the spa, and we had to like. Put our phones in the locker room so after that we went like in like the pool like there's like a hot pool then we went into like the saunas like went sauna ice bath sauna ice bath we went into like the steam room and stuff it must have been like an hour and a half maybe what hour and a half two hours we were there yeah almost two hours yeah i was like how do you stay alone in your thoughts this whole time like all i'm thinking about is like i'm thinking about next week i'm thinking about, yeah, last bro, you week, have... about all sorts of things it's like i need you have something issues though I you need something to, to numb the pain. Like, just give me Bro, some YouTube. This man doesn't, <laughs> music. He doesn't believe in silence. Like, he needs music, a video, something to be... Oh, he's on the phone. Oh, he's just talking. He doesn't shut up. Like, he doesn't believe in silence. Like, you should start to meditate or something, bro. Like, you should spend, like, 10 minutes with yourself no, every no, day. I was doing it today. It was That's the quiet. worst. It was the worst. It's good yeah, for you. Exactly. You need that. Usually I say I stay like five minutes in the steam room, but after five minutes, he was leaving. No, that's but not I, I need that's five not minutes why. in the silence. So I had to yeah. stay 10 minutes every time. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And in my five minutes. <laughs> exactly, bro. The guy was gonna say, in silence. I was going to say on my flight with the armrest thing, mm. I was sitting and I had my hand on the armrest. And it bro, was you the big guy in the flight. Come on, no, no. I am, I am. But, but <laughs> the person next to you is But not. most of the time I concede. Most of the time I'm, I'm right here like this, sleeping like this. Nah, you that's know? not me. But this time I have my hand on the armrest and then there's a, a woman next to me and she's sleeping on my shoulder. I did not say one word to her for six hours. I had my headphones on. I had the fucking eye thing on. I was yeah. Like, was she cute? <laughs> yeah. I'm, 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 I would have taken the cuddle too. Was, like, she, was cuddle, she cute? Cuddle was so important. Was she what? Take it. Was she was cute? What? Was she yeah. cute? Yeah. Mm. I froze. That's There's why. Something. Of course you say nothing. You should have put your arm around her. You should have. <laughs> 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 but honestly, when it, that happens, you got to find the little... The little crease in the back, and you start from the back, and then with time you can like exactly the most yeah. space. Yeah, yeah. You start dominant. <laughs> you gotta be really back first, like you got start deep, and, first, and then you and then walking yeah. into the lazy mud. Hundred <laughs> percent. All right. So I got some overrated, underrated for you. You tell me what you think, and we're gonna discuss them. Um, 
having a strict diet during tournaments is that over or underrated? Um, I'm tending to be more strict now, but I will stay. I will still say overrated a bit. Okay, why do I need? To, oh, uh, and I guess it depends on people. Um, for me, I would say sometimes the mental benefits of, like, for example, last week in in Budapest, like every night we went for ice cream with the guys. Yes, and that is just so good for the mental thing, and that. That that should not be like the amount of your performance is going to be decreased by a little amount, maybe because you don't have as much as good, good stuff in your body. But the fact that you're having a great time with the guys, eating an ice cream and doing something you love, like for the mental uh, stamina over the year and even yeah. for the tournament, just feeling good. I it think makes those 35 weeks a little easier. More than the ice cream will decrease it. So yeah. I would say overrated just because obviously you need to find your good balance, but I think the balance in some way between some good stuff and like something that is not as good, but would give you a lot of joy. That's why I eat ice cream too. Yeah. And yeah. Only, <laughs> only for that reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I eat so... ice cream for the mental stamina. That's why. He went yeah, for nice. a waffle, which I didn't. So I was a little more disappointed. Yeah, but you had a match. <laughs> His balance is a little more in the... No, you had a match. <laughs> I wouldn't have had a, a waffle if I had a match. Honestly, I, I would have had a, <laughs> I had a match. Yeah. I felt it. <laughs> All right, yeah, I feel... Oh, I thought... Okay. Oh, sorry. Go on, go on, go on. No, I was going to say, I, I, I would agree with that, I think. Yeah, me too. Me too. That is... Yeah, it makes those weeks on the road a little bit easier sometimes. And as long as you were doing, let's say, 80%, 90% of the things properly, I think that little 10% of chocolate here or there is not going to... Not going to ruin... Ruined the match. Wait, wait, wait. Does drinking count as diet? Yeah, I don't think alcohol or too much of it should be a part of the diet, especially during the tournament. You guys, you guys drink in the tournament or what? Uh, I have in the past have had like a beer and stuff in tournaments. Yeah, I have. having one drink does not bother me. Yeah, I yeah. had uh, I had actually that week that wasn't good. Uh, it was in between my college year. I, I was doing pretty well at that time. And I was at that time not disciplined at all. Like I would never warm up. And uh, I remember actually, that's a pretty good story. So I show up at the tournament. I at that, I thought I was really cool showing up with the, you know, university backpack. So I was okay. the backpack and just three rackets in my hand. But the thing that That's happened, not cool, bro. That's it's, not cool. No, bro. it's not cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really not. stressful. I regret that period now. <laughs> and but I actually kept on going, not even in the futures. Like when I play Gaskin Ren, I show up on the no court with the backpack and the free rackets in my hand. And <laughs> um and the things in that one is like it was so hot and dry that the grip didn't fully really grip. So two weeks in, like I was playing the qualies, the qualies were playing in the camping that was like the worst place ever, playing on those like weird hard courts. I played the tournament again this year actually. Uh hasn't gotten any better. Um, and the, during the first, the first two days, I break two rackets, dropping them on serves, like in the warm up. So I have two oh, weeks sure. to go and I only have one racket. So every day I'm showing up on the court with a racket and one backpack. And the guy's like, who, who the hell is that guy? He's a and, coach. Right. And also no string, no grips. So the strings is like, I would give my racket to the stringer and there is like the rest of the rail, like half string, like. So I will wake up one morning and my string will be like green and gray and the next it's like blue and purple and every day two, different you, string. You're getting spoiled in college. That's what it was. Yeah. And two weeks like this, just playing and lost qualify semis in the first qualify final in the second. And the second week it was about the drinking. There was that really nice pizzeria place. Crazy nice sangria. And, <laughs> and, and every single, like if I play my match already, if I play in the morning, it would be lunch and dinner. And if I play in the afternoon, it would be only dinner. And I was with that player's dad and we'll be drinking one liter and sangria at two every single meal where I don't have a match after. Are you serious? I'm not kidding. So good. How'd you and... play? Sorry? How did you play the tournament? You played well? Pretty loose. I played that tournament pretty loose, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I qualified, made the final and... Uh... Drunk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, the last night because the pizzeria was like 20 minutes from the hotel and the last yeah. night like 
the my friends left, like the players that I was going with for dinner. So I went with another guy that wasn't drinking. And I still ordered one liter of sangria. So I drink it all by myself. So it took me 15 minutes to go down to the restaurant. And it took us 40 minutes to get back because I, I could not find my way back. It was, <laughs> the, the, ne the next day, though, I didn't do well. I lost one and two and I broke the guy three times. I'll let you do the math about how many times. Oof. I that those, those <laughs> Lesson learned. <laughs> he, he couldn't see the yeah. ball, bro. Lesson yeah. learned. No more sangria since then. Yeah. All right, next one. <laughs> the Olympics. Over or underrated? And I say this because I've been seeing highlights of the Paralympics. And some of that stuff is unreal. I saw a man playing table tennis with the handle in his mouth, pause, and he was yeah. feeding him. He was tossing the ball with his toe, and he was playing table tennis. Yeah, and winning. He's, he's playing against guys that have horns too. That play with their horns and stuff. It's unbelievable. It's or oh, you got like, people like swimming with no arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see the Brazilian guy. I mean, Un unreal. The, that's actually like they just push the limit of the possible. It's crazy what those guys are able to like, do. I think it's more impressive than the regular sports. Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't really tune in, but the, the clips are, are crazy. Yeah, because I think it's just like, sometimes you say like, if you handicap, that's the last sport you would pick. Like, oh, are you going to throw an arrow without horns? And guy just like... <laughs> Finds a way, bro. <laughs> that's it's, it's, that's pretty they, they, they have a lot of people watch or no? I think decent, yeah. Like if you look at like the track and field and stuff, like the the stands are decently full there in Paris. Like it's That's it's hype. pretty cool. It's pretty cool, man. People with like no legs running with the what would you, you call those? The, oh, the prosthetic, yeah. prosthetic, the prosthetic legs and like doing a long jump and stuff. I think I think that you get some more eyeballs on this on these events because it's it's a pretty cool stuff going on there, in my opinion. And I would every say every single guy is just so inspiring too. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's crazy what, what they're going through. Bro, no, if no. Antigua has fucking five regular athletes, guaranteed we have zero in the Paralympics. No chance. Yeah, yeah, no. It, it was so funny, like the ceremony of the Olympics, because he was on boats. Like some country has like <laughs> some country has like massive like cruise boat. And like Antigua would have like yeah, yeah. a sailboat. <laughs> 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 rowing, rowing, rowing that, that little things uh, that look like my did, bash. Did they share uh, boats? Like small yeah, sometimes they share boats. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, we share a boat. But some country like Sierra Leone or like some small country just went with the pride and went on like tiny boats and it's like better not be a wave that <laughs> those guys are in the sand. <laughs> no. was, yeah, and it was raining too. It's yeah, it was raining yeah, too. Tough. All right, next so, one. So the question uh, was about the Olympics. If it's yeah. overrated or overrated? Over or underrated. I guess in I, comparison I to the Paralympics. I would say now, I would say underrated. Just because, I mean, for me, playing tennis, my dream always been to represent my country. And the new format of the Davis, since the new format of the Davis Cup, it's like, that I don't like. I I, I don't think it's like not being able to have those match at home with like full, like, 20 people watching and 20,000 people watching is just like just going away and it's also all indoors so like last year team like Finland are making the semis or yeah. even they are a really good team but it's uh, it's it's like not as complete as the other Davis Cup was and it's not like there is so many more big players playing it yeah. and I think now the Olympics is just the Coolest event to be the, representing your country the, now. The home crowd just used to be cool in Davis Cup, like playing, like in Spain against Spain, like against it's the, the best. Home crowd. Like you're playing in, you know? uh, like those all like Roman arena. Yeah, it feels like yeah. you. If it, it, it felt like a gladiator battle, you know, yeah. when you step on that court, right. and now it's like anti. It's sad. It's sad what they did to the Davis Cup. That's why now I think the Olympics are even more important because. Yeah. That's that's the most important event when you can represent your country. That's true. Not everyone thinks that way though. Mm, yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's why I say underrated. I think. Yeah. I think. I agree. Yeah. All um, right. Next one. Believing that you will win before stepping on the court for a match, over or underrated. I saw that recently, actually. You saw uh, that recently. Yes. Yeah, you that. said that yesterday. Yesterday you were like you woke up with a stiff neck. And you were like, oh my God, like Alan Rubio is going to the semis. You said <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I mean, 
because I, I didn't thought I would be able to serve. Like, I felt so poor in the warm up. Oh, yesterday, I like, Alan Rubio okay. passed the ball to him and he went like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the warm up, I, I felt so poor, but then in the match, it was like way better. That it's what I expect with the adrenaline and stuff. It was just boring for the serve. Uh, just, that's a good question. So, oh, yeah, I remember now. I was reading it on that really good book from a French neuro neuroscientist about like just focus. Oh yeah, and, that one, that book. Yeah, that 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 one book <laughs> that you just read. Uh, I I said right behind you, and you. Yeah. yeah. Book, book thing. Um, and no, it was. Um, I think it's overrated, just because um, it just take away your fight for what is the most important, and sometimes what's going to make you win is just like not the game plan because you don't always have one but at least everything in your power like all those little things you need to focus on to be able to perform mm -hmm. and that's usually really recent things for me like uh last match um my coach have been taking stats on how many time i went to net like my success rate where did i miss my serves or what happened is just like all those little goal i those it would be like three goals a match, like things I need to fix from the match before or the week before. And I think this is more important to think about winning those little challenges than actually winning the things. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't... Thinking about winning does not give you any clue on how are you going to do it. The only yeah. way to, uh, to give you the best chance to win is like actually have a way... Uh, a way of thinking that's gonna allow you to play your best. Yeah, I agree. I would say also overrated because I've I've won matches where I didn't necessarily feel like I was gonna win, and I've lost when I was sure I was gonna win too. I feel like it's it's irrelevant, you know. Yeah. So I think definitely focusing on the how the how of things is definitely much more important. Creating a path with your like process goals, I I would agree that that's that's more important. Yeah, Tizier was playing that challenger in Tunis. And I was playing a local world card. And usually in like North Africa, the guy you play was like 11 each year. So it's like the match where you just like, I cannot lose that match. That mm -hmm. like, it gets you so tight. And I was up 6 0 5 1 playing horrendous. <laughs> and, uh, but the guy was super tight too because he's playing a challengers you know it's big for him too it's like he did not play his best tennis so it looked like i was the 11 years but it was probably like i don't know nine that match it was yeah. nothing well and and i lost one game it's five two and i totally froze and so i played that guy that is just is barely winning matches in juniors uh and i lost six game in a row lost the second set the second set seven five and I twist my ankle and I'm <laughs> sure one set all like ankle hurts and waiting for the physio for 10 minutes ankle because the hurts. guy want, want to finish his lunch. It's like I'm not coming until no I finish my lunch. Ankle hurts and ego hurts. Ego hurts big time. And there were girls <laughs> in the crowd like that came to watch me. So it was like the worst situation possible. She <laughs> was there like watching me struggle against that guy. I'm, I'm glad she didn't know much about tennis because... Yeah, she probably think that's my best tennis, you know. <laughs> and, Did you win? Um, oh, go. And uh, yeah, I, I so I won like six zero five seven six zero. I managed to win that last set. God, I, I was not happy leaving the court. I was just relieved, embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, not. I was kind of proud of myself because okay. I was just like, when I lost that second set, I was like, oh, am I getting out of this? Uh, so. Mm. so it was more relieved and I didn't, I wasn't even embarrassed. I was just like, you know, match the next day. So you've got to think something positive. So I was like, yeah. that was like good mentality for us. And I tried to convince myself that wasn't that bad. But the next day I play even worse. So <laughs> did not work. <laughs> uh, last one, quick one. Have you ever had jamón ibérico, like the Spanish ham? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so the uncooked ham, that's the one yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, we, we have it in France too. And uh, yes, yes, with melon. It's really good. 
So you th you think it's underrated? You think it's good? Uh, I don't. I think it's pretty rated. I know. I this don't know. A, you guys think it's really good? This is a bullshit. I think it's. I think it's overrated. I think. I think. Especially the way they do it in, in Spain is like they have this thick bread, and you put the little ham in the middle, and you just you just biting bread. Uh, yeah, it's overrated so like, because they, they sell that so much, and it's that that thin thing of like. Ah, and like yeah, like and nothing. if you're in the airport in Spain and you need to eat something in the morning and you can't find breakfast, they only have this to sell, oh, and, and it's always... and it's so average. It's like it's, it's actually it's, below. It's, it's, it's actually it's actually it's below really average. average. It's it's actually, not, look at what. Every, it's morning, below every, morning, average. It's average. every morning, it's all depend on the bread. Like the ham, yeah, does not affect the taste. It's all you the can't bread. Can't taste the ham, bro. The ham is yeah. not even there, bro. But yeah. the meal overall is is good. Like no, every morning not. for breakfast here, I eat bread with cheese and like what is it like? Um, it's called saucisson. That yeah, I don't even know what it, you just said. But saucisson. That. What is that? Saucisson. It's uh. It's like sliced it's, meat. Pause. It's like sliced. But similar. how's the bread? The bread. But the, the bread is it's really like good. Baguette. That's why he's loving it. The bread and is good. I, yeah, I've bro, been this. eating him bread with nothing in it, and he's like it as much. It's very good. So, <laughs> yeah, it's overrated. This, yeah, this bro, guy is uh, underrates uh, the um, the starters. Like we uh, had that lunch at the club, and he's never take any salad or melon and everything. I think. But it's like they eat like these so little much. like um, I don't even know what it's called. Like these. It's like grains and like, uh, you know what I'm talking about? The the, it looks like couscous and it looks like these kind of things. Yeah, bro, yeah. Get yeah, involved, like, bro. Get into the culture, bro. I'm trying. Try it, bro. I'm you're trying. not trying. Like it. It's okay. It's Evidently, you're not. You're not it, trying. I had it once. He, you know? he underrated that big time. I do. Un I, I forced underrated. him. I but but the reason the reason why is because like I don't know. I don't really like cold and hot um in the same meal at the same time. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? mm -hmm. What do you mean? I I. What what is the weakest thing? Me saying that I want to go on holiday with my friend, or that guy's just being like, yeah. Oh my oh, god, this is this is hard. This is cold. That. That's worse. Know. That's worse for sure. We we we're that's... getting pretty weak over here. Yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> I'm about to play twelve weeks in a row just to find the fuck up. <laughs> All right. Um. So, plan. We asked Instagram some questions. Yeah. And let's go to the first one. And the first one is. From Jonathan. So this one is first. It's a stat, I guess. So there's a stat in the news showing that Sabalenka's average forehand topspin speed is faster than the men on average at the U.S. Open this year. It's faster than Alcaraz, Sina, Djokovic. Um, she is at 129 kilometers per hour. Alcaraz at 126. Sina 126. Djokovic 122. So the question is, what's the biggest or top two biggest forehands that you faced in? practice or in a match so yeah first of all about that stat i think it's only relevant if you also take into account this the spin like the how oh, much rotation by minutes the ball is spinning at okay then i think you get the more interesting stats don't be and... sexist bro let her have the win bro yeah no i let her out <laughs> uh, no i'm I mean, joking she, i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking she's eating massive I mean, now he's it's, putting it's too like, much on it. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> don't try to save it. Don't try to, no, she, don't try she to save it, bro. Like, when you watch her play, it's 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 like it's incredible. At, at the time, it's like the girls are like three meters away from the ball. She's, yeah, yeah, she's she does, well. she's eating too big for also like girls that not move as well as guys. Like yeah. they're so far away from the ball. It's but I wonder crazy. if that's also why like. With all due respect, like, I mean, I, think I, I don't ball... think she she had to eat that big too. So the guy. No, no, no. Yeah. But but I'm saying like, okay, if if you're playing against Sinner or if you're playing against Alcaraz, like, do you think that on average you're gonna be able to be cracking the ball that hard? You know, like versus if she's just getting a a flat ball that's not that much variety. Like in the men's game, you have like spin high you have more movement you have maybe some slices like different spins so yeah i I think you always have the opportunity to just crack a form yeah it's like i think monfis does it often yeah and true. uh yeah i'm always impressed yo about... he just decides he wants to push right yeah i think it's I just think a decision does. just yeah. like, i just want to make balls today because like if he yeah. if he wanted to he could just go I, I think that's kind of his game if you see him warm up yeah his warm up he just hit the ball the slowest he can down the middle 
and then the guy that would warm him up. So he really warms with a player because it's he's a warmer. It's so weird. And the guy would just like throw a ball at him, and he would rip the ball so hard, and the guy is just like trying to save his life like this, <laughs> and he just rip the next right there, and the guy is like. You know, it's like in the manga, like you touch the ball and you move back a meter. Yeah. That's what happened to the guy that warming up every time. <laughs> and he does that every moment, just pushing it for five minutes and then ripping the ball for five minutes and just boy serves and he's done. Like, that's like me minutes. and you in the warm up on the indoors. Like the ball is not, but the ball, like indoors here does not bounce. It's like lightning mm -hmm. fast. So this man is taking every ball early. Like the ball is going this much over the net onto the baseline. I'm backing up. <laughs> that's my, that's my nightmare. That's hi, what, I'm trying to get, hi, I'm trying to get, <laughs> In the indoors is almost like you play hair hockey. It's like yeah. this. Yeah. It's going under the net. I'm trying to get safety. I'm trying to get eliminate the net error like this. <laughs> trying to lift the ball. But yeah, who's the biggest biggest forehand you had in practice or in a match? Uh, I would say in a match, I would say first of all, teaser when I play, I would say Zizou at Roland Garros was okay. a pretty huge. His forehand cross is massive. The one that hit the forehand strong, JJ Tracy. Oh, yeah, he, he can hit that one the ball. fast. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he's capable of ripping that ball really fast. I, it's not constantly fast, but he's yeah, yeah, he he, he's got the life arm. And I played a guy also, Sultanov. Weak yeah, one cross is like a guy is two two fifty from okay. Uzbekistan. But uh, yeah, Zizou was the biggest one. A Pui. Really what fast one too. Okay. Uh, yeah, main game. Yeah, I would say. He's he said two, bro. Yeah, it, it was. <laughs> it was <laughs> all the best for <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was the first time where I saw him play before, and Is I this? wasn't ready for the pull. Okay. Like I wasn't. I step on the court, and the first point I wasn't ready for the speed. Like okay. it was going faster than I thought it, it was. Okay. Just watching him so much on TV, and, and just TV make it slow. Instant panic after you see the speed. It, no, it's just like the 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 swing are getting shorter, but like for two games I felt like Manarino. I was just seeing every ball like this, <laughs> but but then I kind of I uh, I adjust, but it took me it took me a bit, yeah. Okay, and you just then? Kyle Edmund in practice. Bro, uh... mine is Victor Estrella. Man hit me in doubles. Hit me my chest no, in doubles on a forehand. Which guy? Victor Estrella Burgos from Dominican Republic. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh my God. Man hit the shit out of me with a forehand right in yeah. my chest. I was like... <laughs> <laughs> you took your breath away. Chill out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next question from Ben Locke. Ben Locke. What's the feeling of French players working with the Federation or with private coaches? Um, if they prefer private coaches near home rather than being in Paris or the national center, and does that impact wildcard selections at all? Oh, deep, loaded, loaded Oof. question there. Yeah, that's a tough question. Is 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 he gonna don't, put me in the tough spot? Don't get right don't now? get don't get in trouble, bro. Exactly. <laughs> I feel like he's trying to put me on the tough spot. I'm gonna get banned from tennis soon. Um, some, I don't know if I should say that actually. Uh, the mic closer to at him. the moment where like guys like leaving the federation and yeah. going to a private coach closer to the place instantly start playing better like instantly yeah. Ooh, that's a tough one yeah it's it's <laughs> it happened with Kirian Jacquet okay yeah some guys and some other guys too we had a couple and it was a topic at some point I think the federation is doing a good job like the condition at the national center at nice and they also have great coach but there's so many players like i i think if you're not one of the re top guy of your generation okay. you're not getting as much like attention attention and just the most of the guy will complain that they just don't watch the match and stuff like okay. when you coach don't want the match they don't really oh can they coach me and tell me what to improve when they don't know what what's happening in the match yeah what was where was the struggle at and and does that impact wildcards at all like leaving the french federation or you don't know uh i i think they're doing a good job being fair with that okay i think they're really fair and uh it's re it's really result based and tj i didn't feel that they were like unfairness in all court decision okay. the only one i think that everybody was complaining with was uh the doubles at roland garros okay big big drama and all all what 
the doubles at the Olympics too. And there was that one team, Guinard Jacques, won so many challenges together. And they didn't get a World Cup. And also, Jacques is working with the French Davis Cup team in doubles. He's like the coach of the doubles team. Okay. And everybody felt like on the list, there was like eight World Cards. And, and like 10 guys asked and potentially could get it. And if you rank those guys, like Guinard and Jacques, we thought we're going to be the second team that gets it, like in the orders. Like, we'd be like, First team would be Alice and Mahu and then Guinard Jack and end up not getting it. And, Monf and Murray Evans got it. Okay. In Paris, right before the Olympics, like basically getting, letting um, the British get some like reps, like nice reps on those courts before the Olympics. A day, <clears throat> like a couple of days after uh, Moresmo said, like, uh, we're not giving the wall card to Schwarzman and team in the main draw. Because we don't want it, we don't want to get it to foreign people who have so many good French players, and that would be a shame to not help them. And then that happened in doubles, and uh, I thought that was that was just a little difficult. And also knowing the past, like more small coaching Murray, that was just yeah. a little sketchy. Yeah, that's but, true. Uh, about fairness, I think they're doing a good job, but I, I'm not maybe not in the best position to to answer that question. But I think they really try to do everything based on result and forms and not based on who's practicing with them. Okay. Um, next question from Svat. Um, you won the big Ajaccio future? How do you say that word? Ajaccio? Yeah. yeah. Um, during college break in 2021, at that time you had zero points. And many college players had lots of success during school breaks. Do you think it's because of the high level of quali high quality of college tennis or that you can play without pressure when you're outside of school? There, there was definitely that. That summer between my two years of college, I definitely felt, which is not always because I think to perform at your best, and it's, same, it's like scientifically proven that you need to be in that stress zone when you have a little stress, but not too much. Okay. I love science. Thing, when, when I start playing for myself after, during my college year, like I was so tired <laughs> in college because you play for something bigger and playing for also your teammates, like don't want to disappoint them. And I never been as tight as on a college court when I was playing singles. Okay. It was also no warm ups, like no way to regain to read them quickly. Okay. And so, that summer when I play, I had no stress. I was playing, I did, I play every points the same, even tight points. And that thing that will help me. So is things. it, is it more that you felt less pressure because college you were so stressed or is it because of the quality of players that you were playing in college um, prepared you for that? And also, you know that at the end of the civil period, you go back to school anyway. So Yeah, going back to school was actually the thing that gave me a little pressure because I, want, I wanted to go back and achieve the beat. I had that stupid goal. I wanted to play 50 matches that summer. Okay. And it's... Excuse me? And I wanted <laughs> that summer between my two years, I wanted to play 50 matches. Five zero. Five zero. And also it was stupid, but I was getting used to the UTA rating. And I was like a 13 point four, uh, 14, 15 or something like that. Uh, early 13. And I told the guys in my team, like, I'm going to get back with 50 matches. I'm going to be 14 when I get back. Okay. And it was like, nobody thought I could do it really. And even myself, like it was almost a stupid goal. I don't know if I was drunk when I, I made that goal. And I had like, 14.09 and I play exactly 50 matches. No way. And so actually going back to school, like the fact that I had time limit was the thing that like, kind of stressed me because okay. I needed to. And you think that's the stress that helped you to... To be in the, the good to zone. To be in the good zone. Because otherwise I, I found no stress just playing for myself and yeah. you know being alone in tournaments and no coach around. Yeah. But it also helped because you play lose. And going back to college, you also feel like and that's actually what I don't know everybody should think, but what I think when I'm successful is just playing the tennis that's going to help me improve. Like every time I'm stressed, that's the mode I'm going back to. It's like I'm going to now I'm going to play to improve, like okay. trying to get to net, taking that ball early, uh, changing direction quick. And so you play less for today and more for exactly. the future. And I think that's sometimes what college I've. Uh, college player have successful breaks, summer breaks, just because you know they have 
they play those tournaments and the coach giving them those goals and they're just like having fun. Okay. Nice. All right. Um, you want to run the game and then we roll? Let's do it. So we're going to go. Me versus yeah. you. Wow. First, Is that a quiz? first. Yeah. Yeah. First to three I'm, correct I'm answers. I'm getting in the, FIFA, in the FIFA position when you yeah, lose. Yeah, lean forward a little bit. You're lying in. So first to three correct answers. You're just going to shout, shout out the answer. But okay. if you shout it out and you're wrong, he gets the answer. And you get one, one more attempt at the question. Okay. And if you both okay. miss it twice, you move to the next question. Yeah? Ready. Question number one. Who is the last American to win a Grand Slam? Andy Roddick. Fault. Oh, for fuck's sake. Uh, Williams? No. Pegula. Oh, Coco Golf? 1-0, Jody. He started off a little I, sexist there, wait, boy. Is, he went is, back is to the last three. The, this, this guy just... Oh, that, that reminds me of Murray interview when it, someone was that. asking me about... Uh, he was saying some American player and it's like, it's like male player. And he, yeah. like, he corrected the interview. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. But like that's yeah, Exactly, because... bro. It's a little sexist. I'm just saying it's a little bit sexist, bro. 1-0, Jody. It's, you, because it's it your more... point. It's your point. No, no point. Wait, was that? I feel like I'm losing. I, I won yeah. the point. I make you won the point. I feel like I won it, though. <laughs> yeah, <that's crazy. laughs> All right. All right. Number two. I barely if... win, by the way. I barely win these games. And he's, I'm never actually, he's never actually won. They no, no, say. no. I won the last game. I won he last won, game. but I right. messed up the put question. Some I gave stress. It. I'm getting in the right Come stress. Down, the zone. The, talking the, about. the scientist here. Okay. If I question win, this two. is over, by the way, right? No, no. Was it question number two. First three. First two, three. Yeah. Okay. What is the capital of Norway? Wow, this is bad. I thought for sure Chidek would get this one quick. Yeah, that's you're European, bro. That's right. That's that's, that's in your backyard, bro. Is it sad that I know zero places in Norway? But I'm just like I'm gonna give you guys. I feel bad if I miss. I, I would say Oslo, but I'm probably yes, wrong. That's, that's correct. Oh, that's also okay. You can't do this. <laughs> You can't do this. You can't make the game just for my opponent to win. And that's why you always lose. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get tired and he's going to say, oh, math question. And you know, this guy reads books. Like, come on, dog. Come on. True or false? Yannick Sinner has not dropped a set and rooted your Open final. False. 2 1, Jody. Guess what? It's a 50 50 shot. You just gotta shout whatever yeah. comes up. <laughs> so let it rip. Come on. Really? Okay. I don't know. He lost a set to Maki, Maki and Maki to Medvedev. Yeah, true. Yeah. Okay. What is. Okay, this question is gonna be a number question. Oh. And the closest to the right answer wins. Okay. What is the capacity of Arthur Ashe Stadium? I knew it. I knew it. You go first because I kind of have an idea. I'm going to be go, way off. And go for it first. 30,000. Okay, 26. Chidek, two, two. <laughs> what is it? Like 26 something, right? It's 23,771. Oh, okay. I was I was over. Let's go. All right, here we go. Sudden death? Sudden death. Do not do math. Don't do math. All right. Come on. What is... The only game point on the do side in a singles match. 4-15. Jody won the game, bro. Oh, wow. Hey, wow. <laughs> yeah. Well played. Yeah, <laughs> All right. All right, Clem. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh, thanks for inviting me. No, no problem. Yeah. Anytime. And uh, good luck tomorrow in the final. Let's go. Final of 25. Um, thanks for watching, everybody. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe if you like the content. And I would say buy some merch, but the online store is now closed. So, yeah, um, we're in France. We'll be here for another week. Justin's in Serbia working, so feel free to shoot us a good luck message if if you're, you're with it or comment down below a good luck message. And, um, yeah, comment down below also um, who we should have on in the coming weeks. We're going to be in Europe for a little bit. So, so, yeah, thanks for watching and see you guys next week.